Hello everyone, welcome back to DSP vs. the Internet, episode 59, for April 7th, 2024. This week we actually have a super supporter that submitted a question. Remember, if you're a super supporter of this channel, you can actually do a Q&A question um, for the show. And we haven't had one in many weeks, but this week we actually have someone who submitted one. So we'll answer that, and then we'll jump back into the videos, okay? So... Here's the question. Have you considered playing PC indie games on PC or your mini PC like a once a week mainly late night chill stream? It can be done easily with new games for a nice change of pace. If it doesn't work out and you play it for less than one stream, you can always return it on Steam. If you do, I recommend a game called My Summer Car. It's 10 bucks and really fun. I'll tell you more, but it's one of those games where the first time playing it is your overall best experience. Um, <clears throat> I will absolutely admit the one thing that I have not really utilized whatsoever, okay, since I got it last year, is my mini PC. If you remember, I received it in the fall or late summer, and we did a Chrono Trigger playthrough, and then I got busy with all the new releases of, of the fall, and then in December for the Christmas Marathon, I played Phasmophobia, and that's literally the last time we've used it. I only used it twice, basically, um, for two different things. Why? Because we've been so busy with so many other insanely long projects like <clears throat> Baldur's Gate 3 that we really haven't had free time in the schedule to really look into that kind of stuff. Now, is it possible that I could use it? Sure. Absolutely. And now I would say could be one of those opportunities. In fact, over the next week, I'm going to complete a game. And like we said, it looks like we're going to have maybe one or two games to do as day streams, but we may have opportunity for freedom of the night streams. If this is something you guys are interested in, let me know. I would be open to trying it, but we'd have to look at it together and figure out, is it something neat? Like, I'll be honest. Most of the time when I try indie games, they don't work. I've tried many indie games over the years and people just like, eh, I don't like it. I don't want to see it again. Or they see the once and that's it. Now, what you're saying is buy it and then refund it, right? I feel like on Steam, likely you can do that a certain amount of times, but after a while, what if like every time we try an indie game, I play it for one night stream, people don't like it, and then I end up refunding like five, six times. Steam isn't just going to let me infinitely refund, right? Like eventually they're going to be like, all right, you're a, you're a habitual refunder. You're never going to actually keep a purchase, right? <laughs> but maybe not. I don't know. I really don't know how it works because I'm not a PC player these days. So I don't know how uh, you know, lax they are with it. Um, but it now I would say would be the time to possibly do something like that. And not, not this week but possibly maybe like next week, let me know. Again, we're looking for a game to put into the rotation as like a night stream. If you guys would like me to explore something like that, it's a possibility, okay? So thank you for the question. You're right, I do not utilize the mini PC enough and maybe that's something that we can do very soon, okay? By the way, I do wanna give a shout out to DL5FSE who is an ultra member and did, uh, uh, they popped their message earlier today. I forgot to read it out. It says, I forget to do these members these member messages I love you uh, so much. You stick to your lane. You're having a fun time on here. You let us submit videos. Uh, you know, it's nice to step away any from any kind of drama on YouTube. Yeah, I don't, I don't play the drama game. I don't, I don't want to play the drama game. I feel like I have enough to offer YouTube and the internet without having to cause drama and be hateful towards others. So, um, okay, how a teen built a nuclear reactor. Good lord. All right. David Hahn, also known as the Radioactive Boy Scout, built a nuclear reactor in his mom's backyard uh, out of common household items aware? when he was 17. As shocking as that is, that a teenager built a nuclear reactor at his mom's house, the story of what made it all possible and the terrible mess it created is even more insane. David was born just outside of Detroit, Michigan in 1976. His parents, who both worked for General Motors when they employed basically everyone in the area, unfortunately divorced when David was still very young. Growing up, he spent most of his time living at his dad and stepmom's house and lived on the weekends at his biological mom, Patty's house. When he was 10 years old, his grandfather, his stepmom's dad, gave David a seemingly harmless gift which would start this soon-to-be out-of-control chain of events <laughs> in motion. The gift was a book called The Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments, and David was instantly obsessed. Mm. David set up a small laboratory in his bedroom at his father's house. But this wasn't like the pretend fun beakers full of water with food coloring in them type laboratory you might normally find in a kid's room. No, David bought legit beakers, Bunsen burners, test tubes, and lined his shelves with chemistry books in volumes and volumes of the encyclopedia. 
by 14 when most are messing around with relatively harmless experiments or making baking soda volcanoes, David had fabricated nitroglycerin. David was also in the Boy Scouts. And uh, one time so immediately the question is, where are the parents? I understand they're divorced, but where are the parents? They're not paying attention to what the kid is doing. They just let him buy all this crazy chemicals and science equipment and have access to all of it and don't supervise him and just let him do whatever he wants, basically. Wow, that's a real formula for success, isn't it? I showed up to a Boy Scout camping trip with a bright orange face caused by an overdose of canthaxanthin which he claimed he was taking to test methods for artificial tanning. <laughs> he was literally performing experiments on himself when he was just a kid. On that same trip, David, along with some of his fellow scouts, blew a hole in one of their tents by igniting a stockpile of magnesium David had brought along to make fireworks. Despite the fact that David's father and stepmom were frequently alarmed by small explosions and chemical spills in their son's bedroom, they didn't put a stop to his experimentation. Wow, well, great They just people. made him move his lab setup down to the basement as they were tired of him destroying his room. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, when you have a child, you are responsible for the raising of the child, period. None of this bullshit where people are absentee parents or feel like they don't have, uh, uh, the community raises them, no. You're the parent, you're legally responsible, you raise the kid. If the kid becomes a mass murdering serial killer, it's your fucking fault, period. I didn't know my son had problems and was going to go on a rampage and blow buildings up and kill people. You should have. That's the point of being a parent. It's your responsibility to make sure that your child becomes a productive member of society. If you're not gonna do that, don't have the fucking kid, period. That's your choice in life. You have a kid, you're now responsible. You don't have the kid if you don't want to be responsible. Enough is enough. Why are people not held accountable for this? Seriously, why are people not held accountable for the actions of their children? I'm lost. If a kid goes on a crime spree, you arrest the kid and you arrest the fucking parent too. And they both go to jail. Then it won't happen again. I don't understand it. I don't. Marking the walls with various explosions and spilling chemicals all over the carpet. Astronaut says, what if the kid has mental health issues from the beginning? Then you recognize, get it diagnosed, you get treatment. All right? There's always going to be extenuating circumstances, okay? In this case, this is a situation where the parents know this kid is doing things a child should not be doing. He's making chemicals, blowing things up, and he could harm people around him, and they just ignore it. That's not being a parent. That's being an irresponsible piece of shit. This is likely where all of this should have been put to a stop, but it wasn't. And David started heading down an even more dangerous path with his experiments. Banishing him to the basement was actually the opposite of punishing David. Right. Now he just had more room and more privacy exactly. to conduct his experiments. He only became more obsessed and more focused on chemistry. Wow. He held down a variety of after-school jobs just so he could make money to buy materials uh. to mess with in his laboratory. Soon, David would do something that would cause another change in location for his laboratory. He had gotten a hold of a bunch of red phosphorus, basically match heads, and he placed it in a glass container and started hammering it with a screwdriver. And yeah, it exploded. He injured his hands and arms badly, and he had to have glass, which exploded from the container, removed from his eyes. He had glass shards explode into his eyes, because of course, David wasn't wearing goggles. Again. This seems like the time any parent or guardian right. would take away the chemistry kit. But in this case, David just moved his lab to his biological mother's potting shed in her backyard. And that's where things started to get radioactive. David would spend countless hours in the shed doing God knows what, but both his mother and his mother's boyfriend never cared to check in on right. him. They were both just in awe of his work ethic and dedication. One day, David's mom's boyfriend, Michael, did ask him what he was up to. And David responded by saying, you know, Someday we're going to run out of oil. And here we go. David's dad thought that his son needed to take his obsessive work ethic and put it towards something useful, becoming an Eagle Scout. Eagle Scouts need to earn 21 merit badges across a variety of disciplines. Some are mandatory, but a few of them are Scout's choice, as it were. You could earn a badge in business or woodworking, for example, but David went ahead and opted to earn a badge in atomic energy, Great. which raised a red flag to absolutely no one, even though David was the only scout in the troop's history to go after that merit badge, <laughs> and he had a history of blowing himself up. David put together an information pamphlet with the help of several utility companies to go towards earning his atomic energy badge. The general gist of the pamphlet was that nuclear energy was good, 
Nuclear energy was vital and nuclear energy needed to be studied more. He also made a chart explaining nuclear fission and a harmless toy model nuclear reactor using a juice can, coat hangers, soda straws, kitchen matches, and a rubber band. David also had the opportunity to visit a hospital's radiology unit to learn how they use radioactive isotopes. And in the end, David was awarded his Atomic Energy Merit Badge on May 10, 1991, just a few months before his 15th birthday. So how did he- Not content with his fake- How in the holy hell did he make the real one, right? That's really what we gotta find out. Where did he get the radioactive isotopes to make the real reactor? Nuclear reactor he made out of soda cans and coat hangers, David decided he was going to build an actual radioactive nuclear power reactor in his mom's potting shed. And guess what? He did. But to do so, David would have to overcome some obstacles, and a few more adults would have to not ask any questions. Right. David set out to build what's known as a breeder reactor, which is a specific type of nuclear reactor that not only generates power, it continuously creates new fuel for itself in an endless self-sustaining cycle. In theory, solving the world's energy problem. There were a few functioning large-scale breeder reactors built, but they were all either shut down for not actually producing cost-effective energy, or they had partial meltdowns. Before we get into the type of stuff David would have to acquire to build a breeder reactor, here's a very simplified explanation of the science behind it. Mm -hmm. All reactors rely on a bunch of a naturally radioactive element, typically uranium or plutonium, as the fuel for a sustained chain of reactions known as fission. Fission occurs when a neutron combines with the nucleus of a radioisotope, like uranium, and transforms it into a new, highly unstable form of uranium that immediately splits in half, creating a massive amount of energy, and causing a chain reaction of endless combining and splitting and the releasing of energy. Anyway, if that went over your head, don't worry about <laughs> it. The point is, David would have to get his hands on a bunch of legitimately radioactive and extremely dangerous materials. Right. Which should basically be impossible, right? Nope. Not really. Here's how he did it, and be warned. It will shake your faith in just about everything. Oh, well. Quite simply, David just pretended to be a college professor, writing letters and making phone calls to places like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, the American Nuclear Society, the Edison Electric Institute, and the Atomic Industrial Forum. And then nobody decided to double-check David's made-up identity. Here's the oh. thing. Earlier on this very week's show, we had a video about how in your 40s, you realize everyone's just faking it. We have this weird <clears throat> impression of safety, authority, and that everyone knows what they're doing and there's safeguards in place for everything. And then COVID hit and we found out it's all bullshit. It's a smoke screen. No one was ready for COVID. And now what we're finding in our society, no one's ready for anything. Everything is just a, a, a pretending to be ready. But so many things are easily foolable, cheatable, bypassable, you know, easy workarounds for everything, right? I mean, hell, right now we got an epidemic on YouTube, these fake gifted memberships. There's nothing to stop that? No. Well, wait, why does YouTube promote memberships on the site like it's something good if someone can buy them for less than a penny each? Because YouTube is fucking stupid and they don't have safeguards in place to stop abuse. So he found a way to work the system, abuse it, and get what he wanted because the system's broken and everyone's just faking safety when there really is none. Over the phone, a rep from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ended up basically walking David through the entire process of obtaining and isolating radioactive isotopes. Normally, no one person would be able to legally obtain a large enough amount of the radioactive materials needed to pose any sort of danger. But this isn't a normal situation. This is David freaking Han. He was an Eagle Scout. David later said, The NRC gave me all the information I needed. All I had to do was go out and get the materials. And he did. From his conversations with government officials and by looking over old Boy Scout booklets, David learned that you could find small amounts of radioactive elements in smoke detectors, old luminous clocks painted with a radioactive paint oh, and yeah. the numbers on the clock glow, yep. and old camping lanterns. Just one of each of these items wouldn't cut it. David would need a large amount, more than any normal person would ever purchase to get what he needed. So, David just kept on pretending to be a professor and began his journey of procuring radioactive elements from these everyday items until he found something that succeeded in creating fission. First, he called up a smoke detector company and said he needed 100 smoke detectors for a quote, school project. Not only did they agree to ship him 100 smoke detectors for a low price, they told him exactly where the radioactive material was located in the device. 
without ever getting confirmation of his identity or intentions. David received the smoke detectors, immediately obtained the radioactive material from all of them, which was a Mercium 241 by the way, welded it all together, and placed it inside of a lead casing with a small hole punctured in it, creating what is known as a neutron gun. Wow. The first step to achieving fission. Still, no adults have stepped in to stop this. From there, keeping in line with David's obsessively focused work ethic, and keeping in line with the theme of no adults asking any questions or sounding any alarms whatsoever, David was able to extract thorium from thousands of old camping lanterns, and get his hands on radium from old luminescent clocks which he purchased from an antique store. All that along with some uranium he had ordered from Czechoslovakia over the phone because why the hell wouldn't that be possible, and some barium sulfate from the nurses at the local hospital's radiology ward, who just sort of gave it to him. David made a makeshift reactor core out of the highly radioactive radium and immersium he had gotten from the smoke detectors and clocks. Then he surrounded this radioactive ball with a blanket composed of tiny foil-wrapped cubes of thorium ash, which he got from the old camping lanterns, and uranium powder, which were stacked in an alternating pattern with right, carbon... So we don't even have to watch the rest. Essentially, he found a way to fool everyone around him and got what he wanted because people are stupid. And again, there's so much in this world that's not safe. You think it is, but it all relies on humans being smart and doing the right thing. And the moment that someone becomes lax, lazy, stupid... You know, we're all at risk. He could have blown up his town with a nuclear reactor, you know? But this is it's fine, right? Okay. Um, ne This next video will be the last one of this part. And, yeah, look at this. So, this is three years old, only 21,000 views. The whole topic of this is so weird to me like i let's see how this guy tackles it but to me this is the weirdest shit that this is even part of any culture okay a lolly is well i'm not sure on the exact definition but what it's used for now and for what i'm talking about is a drawn or animated female that looks or is extremely young like under 16. yeah that sounds creepy as any normal-minded person would think but Ped seemed to use some advanced mental gymnastics that, because the girl in the anime or whatever is technically over 18 years old, they aren't creeps. But today, no I'm gonna sense. explain in a way you can't argue against why liking lollies in that way makes you a pet. And if you're getting angry just hearing me say that, you of all people should keep watching. And Yeah, it's so weird to me. I don't understand this culture. And, you know, you get exposed to things on the internet. I didn't even know that this existed. Okay? when I was younger. And then as the internet got more prominent and you start just finding shit on the internet, you find out about different kinds of culture over in Japan and stuff. And apparently this is a part, an ingrained part of their culture, both in manga and anime and stuff. It's a thing. And it's like, I guess it, it, it boils down to in Japan, their age of consent slash the age when you're considered a legal adult is much, much lower than it is in the United States. Here it's 18. You have to be 18 years of age to make legal decisions and be considered a legal adult. But I guess in Japan, it's much lower. I don't know exactly where or like what the age is. I think someone had said earlier, like weeks ago, it was like 15 or something like that. It's way younger. And so over there, they have this culture of like gross perversions about like younger girls could be considered you know, uh, desirable objects sexually. It's disgusting. It really is. Like, to me, that's disgusting. I think it's really gross, you know? And I don't delve into it. I know it exists. I keep hearing that term, so I know it exists. But, you know, I've stayed away from it on purpose because I don't want nothing to do with it. It's like, dude, this is fucking really weird shit, this whole cultural thing. Now, maybe it's just the internet hyper-focuses on the weird shit. And so you hear about it and stuff. It was 13 last year? You're considered an adult at the age of 13 in Japan? Oh my god. So there you go. I mean, completely young, underdeveloped people are being considered legal adults. And so their culture has this weird shit about it. It's just fucking weird, man. Now the thing is, I know for a fact that in human history, there used to be cultures where you would have arranged marriages where like young girls would be married to adult men, right? It's like, what the fuck? 
it's really that's really really bad and i think what's happened is over time we've our cultures have changed and we've learned better but some cultures don't some cultures just stay stuck in the past i think that's where this whole thing this movement has originated from right that people find this weird perversion of of having attraction to young girls and yeah it's disgusting Anyway, it's only a five minute video. Let's see what the guy has to say. If you really want to argue, I'm down. Drop your stupid comment below after the video. This guy's now let's really, get this guy it. is really like slamming people who, who are into it. As you can see, he's very offensive towards them. My opinion. Before I get into the stupid arguments, I want to disclose what I believe. It's really basic. Lollies are bad. Lollies are for perverts. Saying a character is 18 doesn't make them 18 and if you enjoy them in that <laughs> way you should be on a registry See, the, the thing is again if the legal age of adulthood in japan is like 13 like you guys just said i don't know if that's true or not i'm just going off what people are saying in my chat if if that's the case then why are you saying oh well the, that girl is 18 then why even say that in japan the legal age is 13 correct is it just because they want to be able to like like sell this kind of content outside of Japan so they have to say that but in reality everyone's like yeah we it's 16 now being told it's been changed to 16 but it was 13 at one point right but that's what I mean like are they just lying on purpose are they saying no actually we know that this girl in this piece of art or whatever it was was actually you know, supposed to be basically like 13, 14, 15, but because we want to be able to sell this content outside of Japan, we say that she's actually 18, right? That way it covers the bases internationally. But it's fucking bullshit, right? It's, gro it's gross, man. Ugh. Argument 1 hmm. slash the Reddit argument. So to start off, I'll explain what I call the Reddit argument. Which is basically this. Although the girl looks very young, her character is above 18, so I'm not a pet. What? This argument is stupid. Here's why. Although the character is technically 18, 27, 5,000 or whatever, <laughs> her face and body are that of a right. very young girl. That's what you're attracted and to. And what they're attracted to isn't the fact she's illegal, quote unquote. They're attracted to her body and face, right. which match that of an underage girl. Gross. And let me say, the creators of a character usually just make them a legal age so they can have better publishing range exactly. or just to they satisfy could, their perverted urges without legal. revealing them directly. And usually that would be the end of the argument, but PEDs do have a rebuttal. A bad one, but one nonetheless. Argument 2 slash the she isn't real argument. <laughs> The she isn't real argument states that since the girl isn't real and is just a drawing, I'm not a ped. This one is infuriating and very easily beaten. For one, a character when drawn, it's easy to tell roughly what their age is. And I'll show you some examples of all this in the anime style. How old is this man here? <laughs> about 60 to 65. And this woman? Yeah, about 20 to 25. And how about this one? Yeah about 9 to 13. So once again, although it is just a drawing, what these peds are attracted to is the girl in the drawing, who looks like, and say it with me, a very young child. Right. Mm -hmm. So by the Reddit squared law, they are attracted to a drawing. The drawing is of a 10 year old. They are attracted to 10 year olds. And although they can say something along the lines of, well, I'm not attracted to real children, they are attracted to quote unquote, fake children which still represent and look like children this is such a yeah. simple argument i can't build it up any better i don't again i don't know if this guy is offensive and people don't like him but it's kind of hard to argue with him his logic he's right if you're someone lusting over something it doesn't matter if you're acting on it you're still lusting over something disgusting and you know it, it makes you what people label you as it, it is sorry if you're lusting over underage girls or pedophile you are it's 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 cause and effect it's oh well she's not real it doesn't matter if the person's real you're still lusting over someone underage you are a pedophile that's bad right sorry i don't really see any 
way to argue out of that at all <laughs> in any way. Argument three slash the it helps people argument. The it helps people argument is most definitely the worst one I've heard. So this argument states that lolly images help people so they can work out their urges and not hurt any actual children. This is an asinine and very harmful argument. Yes, it is. So first off, no, if you actually need to- No, because what it's doing is, it's, it's saying it's okay to have that then, or to have those thoughts, and it's not. As long, I can have those thoughts as long as I don't act out against real people. Well, no. It's not. It's still harmful, disgusting thoughts that normally wired humans wouldn't have. You know, it's incredibly harmful. It, and the thing is, if you entertain the thought, and you continue the thought and you promote the thought, which is what these companies are doing through this, this content. They're trying to make money on it, right? Now, it could be the bridge to the real life thing. As opposed to if you acknowledge it's wrong and you don't entertain the thoughts, then you have a, probably a way less chance of continuing on further with that. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. I mean, this, I don't, again, I don't know who this guy is, never heard of him but I have to tend to agree with the arguments. They're pretty sound, I would say. Masturbate to images of fake children so you don't go out and do unspeakable acts to real kids? You should be in prison. Because when someone wants to hurt a child and the only thing preventing that is a stable internet connection, yeah. they should not be in the public. In fact, they should be on a sex offender's registry because it seems like at any moment, a child near them could be in serious danger. And second of all, if someone is constantly using lolly imagery, I can assure you that is going to be basically reprogramming their brain to see both real and fake children in a sexual manner, which is bad for both, you know, heads and society. Well, I have built up my rebuttal to these arguments in favor of lolly as well as I can, and it's time to end this video. Outro. If you genuinely want to fight about this, I will argue with you in the comments or whatever. Yeah. But before you do that, if you actually listened to my entire video and really took in what I said and came out the other end thinking that being attracted to illustrations of young girls doesn't make you a ped, you're probably a ped. Anyways, my name is Marco of MIC Studios. My I, uh, I can't argue with the guy. I really can't. I can't, I can't argue with it whatsoever. I think he's uh, correct in his assessment and his his logical reasoning you by promoting something that's virtual it's not real so it's okay no it's not it's not there's a difference between art and promotion of something that is harmful you know what i'm saying like it's it's of course people will always argue another way and say what about violence well we watch incredibly violent content right we do and so is that does that make that the violence okay Here's the thing, like, when you watch incredibly violent content, like, for example, The Walking Dead, where zombies are ripping people apart, you say, well, it's fantasy, it's not real, it's not promoting the violence, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we see the ultra-violence as bad, right? Like, that's the downfall of man, is that the zombies are eating everyone, correct? That's not, oh, life is good because all these zombies are eating everyone. That's not the point, you know, of the ultra... I guess if you had something that was so glorifying violence as a good thing, perhaps that's bad. And I think there's been arguments that way. If we started saying that mass murder was great, that would probably be a problem, right? Like for, uh, what was the, the thing? The, the Purge, the Purge TV, uh, movie series. Once a year, everyone can just go out and murder everyone else and it's all legal. Like, obviously that's not, that's, that's, that's not real. That's fantasy and it's bad. It's meant to be horror, right? That's the point. When you see things that are fantasy horror, they're meant to be, excuse me, fantasy violence is meant to be horror, correct? This is fantasy sexual content. It's not horror. It's meant to be like, it's for an audience that think they enjoy it and it's okay because it's fantasy. No, it's still not. You know what I'm saying? So, all right. So, yeah, I agree with this guy's arguments. All right, we got one more part coming here on DSP versus the internet. I will see you for that in a sec or in the next video.